Hi, I'm Jim. Uh, we're back again in, with another installment of The Fun Never Ends. Um, what I'm doing now is, well, my fuel tank split. Uh, this seam here, you come in here. Uh, it cracked in here and it was leaking. This is not the first time I've had this tank out. Um, over here, this is on the bottom seam. But I'm, I'm not sure why this is happening because, you know, the tank is supported all along here and that should be pretty solid. And so there shouldn't be much load up here um, other than maybe some oil canning at the top. So it seems like an odd place for it to crack unless it was just that this original TIG weld was too, too thin, not enough penetration into the overlap. But that's been re-welded and I've leak checked it and it's good. So, um, but my confidence is not as high as I'd like. So rather than do fabric repair and, you know, be faced with doing this all over again, uh, I'm gonna make a aluminum sheet, or aluminum, yeah, aluminum sheet to cover this so I can take the tank in and out without doing a lot of fabric work. So the tank, sit, the tank sits in here. There's these um, angles with uh, cork on them that hold it, support it on each, on each end, and it kind of sits in the middle. Um, this is the, the spar cap here, or flange. For the main spar, there's a piece of aluminum angle right here, and then the wing ribs. So my plan is I'm going to drill out the rivets in the, um, that hold the fabric down and replace those with sheet metal screws that hold the fabric and the uh, aluminum cover down on both ribs. Back on the trailing edge and up on the leading edge, I'm going to drill holes and put in some nut plates. We'll rivet those in. Um, now you may be sitting here thinking he's going to drill holes in the spar caps. Uh, hey, you know, what could possibly go wrong? It's only the main spar of the wing. No big deal drilling holes, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, if one of the things I, I, I did uh, for entertainment uh, and as a project for my students as well, um, we calculated the loads on this wing uh, around the main spar. And as you may expect, uh, let me see, is this in the picture? No. So this is where the main spar attaches to the aircraft, and as you can see, it's just a single bolt. So it's essentially a pinned connection here. So there's, it's not going to carry much in terms of bending moment. So the, and so the moment here is, is nearly zero, and the wing is supported by a strut. And if you do the calculations, um, yeah, the moment really is close to zero here. There's the maximum bending moment is at the wing strut. Um, Shear, the shear is maximum at the strut. There's a, a doubler in the weld web out there. Um, there is some shear stress here that's you know trying to move it up and down. And then there's a normal force. There's compression in the spar from the, the fact the wing strut's under tension when the aircraft is flying in a positive G. Uh, the wing strut is in tension. That means there has to be a compression here on this to counteract that. And um, we're going to step away from the airplane for just a little bit and uh, go to the computer and I'll walk you through that process and I'll try to remember to put a link up here to uh, see if you want to skip the math, you know, what the heck. Um, so we'll go there and um, talk about the loads and why I think it's okay and then we'll come back and get to work and, um, oh, one more thing of course, as usual, I ain't no A&P so Anything you see here, take it with a grain of salt. So, thanks for tuning in, and I hope you find it entertaining. So, I'm going to step away from the airplane for just a moment and kind of talk about the forces in the spars and why I'm not all too terribly upset about drilling holes in the main spar down there near the root. Um, this is my starting assumptions about the distribution of lift across the span of the wing. So, across the x-axis here is the wingspan starting at the root right there uh, and out to the wing tip out here uh, and on the y-axis axis is the 
local coefficient of lift or how much lift um, any particular point on the wing is creating relative to the other points. So we get the, the most lift in here from close to the wing root and as you get out towards the tip it drops off significantly due to the you know the tip vortexes and things like that and uh, span wise flow. Uh, some of the assumptions here are that uh, the aircraft weighs 1300 pounds. Um, I'm pulling 3.8 G's for the when we get to the actual numbers in, in the next uh, few plots and I did this calculation based on the data from uh, Abbott and von Donhoff. Um, actually, they developed most of this data in the 1940s at NACA, the predecessor to NASA. Um, one of those oldie but goodie books. Okay, so that's my my assumption about the distribution of lift across the span of the wing and I have it here superimposed on a picture and you can kind of see how the lift falls off at the at the tip. Uh, given that lift distribution on the wing and the geometry of the strut and things I come up with um, a tension on the strut of 5100 pounds at the wing root. I've got uh, the spars in compression 400 and 4,400 pounds. There's about 100 pounds of vertical force right at the wing root, not much. Just about the whole airplane is, is hanging from that, that uh, strut, you know, which has a single bolt here and a single bolt there, something to think about when you're flying. <laughs> Either one of those bolts go, you know. Yeah. But uh, these numbers are, you know, from my back of the envelope calculations here, um, I'm comfortable with, with the structure and the bolts and the uh, size of that strut, uh, but I, I should say I'm not an expert on aircraft structural loads or anything like that, so um, take all this with a grain of salt. But if I take those reaction forces and the lift distribution and put that all together to get the distribution of the bending moments and the shear loads in the spar itself, I get these two graphs uh, where again, the x-axis is starting at the root and going out to the wing tip. The top one is the shear force, or the, if I look at a piece of the spar here, it's it's sheet metal, and there's that angle on on the on the caps. Okay, and this is sheet metal. The shear force is forces essentially trying to make the the uh, spar split along a plane like that, you know, up and down. Um, zero at the tip, there's nothing going on there. It's pretty small at the root. Uh, and we, we came up with 100 pounds uh, in that other diagram. And there's a big change in the force here where the strut applies that load. And that's that's all what's, what you'd expect. Uh, bending moment is the force that would tend to make the spar, well, I'm drawing it the wrong way, tend to make the spar bend like this. Okay, um, the units there are foot pounds. And again, as you'd expect at the tip, it's zero. At the root, it should be zero because we have a pin joint, uh, just a single bolt there. Uh, in this calculation, it didn't quite come to zero. A lot of that is due to the interpolation and round off errors and accumulated errors in the integration. Uh, maximum is right here where the strut attached. I come up with about 4,100 pounds of bending moment. Um, this discontinuity here in the shear is about 2,600 pounds. That's the vertical force from the, from the strut. So if I take those raw forces and try to translate those into the actual um, stress on the spar itself, the actual forces in the aluminum, you know, the pounds per square inch, um, I, get, I get this uh, for the maximum stress maximum fiber stress in the spar cap, um, it's in compression because the wing is trying to, well, let me draw that again. If that's my wing bending, okay, um, exaggerated, I hope. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the outside of this curve is, is longer, so the, the, the bottom of the spar is in tension. It's pulling on it, 
and the top of this bar is in that's a lousy arrowhead is in compression as we try to push okay plus you know when we had the the strut attached it's creating that force at an in compression um, because the struts at an angle so I can add the compression in the top spar uh, top spar cap due to bending and the compression due to the strut uh, so we get this jump here at where the strut attaches and this gives me the essentially the fiber stress in the spar cap itself um, uh, maximum here is somewhere around 2100 down here at the root uh, I've got about 5,200 pounds per square inch, uh, or one quarter of what it is up near the near the spar attach or the strut attach. So I could throw away, you know, three quarters of the material down here near the root and still not exceed the stress in the that we find up here. So I'm I'm reasonably comfortable, and and these numbers too are are within. You know, have a have a good safety margin uh, according to my calculations from the uh, limits of the materials. So, drilling some holes in the spar cap out here, or even more so out there, um, it doesn't reduce the load that the airplane could carry in terms of you know where's it going to break? Because if it breaks, it's going to break here. Uh, so, that's my analysis. Uh, don't write home about it, but but that's kind of what the way this sort of thing runs. Um, hopefully, you found that somewhat entertaining. Okay, so back to the hangar. Okay, this one of the rivets I want to drill out. I could um, I could you know screw it in in between the rivets, but um, then you know the surface would be all wavy as it went over it. So I'm going to try remove the rivets with the minimum disruption to the fabric and we'll count on the um, screws in the sheet metal cover to essentially hold the fabric in place and then the screws there's um, the reinforcing tape you might be able to see the see it from there to there so the, that's underneath the rivets all I'm really covering cutting is the uh, tape that goes over the top of the rivets kind of blend them in So we'll try to do this with a minimum of disruption. Um, I don't have a punch small enough, so I'm abusing abusing a drill bit to uh, get that out, get the core of the pop rivet out. The nice thing about pop rivets is they have a hole in the center, so it's easy to center the drill. The downside is they don't grip that good, so they tend to spin unless you take it pretty slow. And it's spinning. So, solution for that, typically what I do is take the knife, kind of slide it underneath the edge without letting it slip and stab me. If I can put a little pressure on the head, that, oh, there we go. Now it was holding. twist to the knife. There we go. That went right through. Okay, and there's a hole I can use. So one, one, two, three, four, about eight more of those and I'll have that done. Okay, so I've got this sitting where it needs to be. All I need to do now is get the holes that are in the spark or the rib caps into the aluminum. So I made this, uh, took a piece of scrap, bent it around, took a um, rivet, punched, you know, pushed out the uh, center point, an eighth inch pop rivet, epoxy that into place. I don't know how well that shows up. And I should be able to use that to transfer the holes. 
lift this up. There's a hole. That's down in the hole. I got a transfer punch. It's a cheap ass transfer punch from Harbor Freight. And I got a nice dimple there. I'm going to drill that out and then uh, put a Clico in it and we'll move down to another hole and you know we'll get kind of slow for the first few holes and then I can punch all the rest. Okay, so that that's not going to move. I can make sure everything's where it needs to be. Looks good and I can then come down and I'll do the same thing at down this corner. That'll hold it in place and uh, I can just do a bunch more. I think I'll just do those off camera because it can't be that exciting to watch me punching holes. Oh boy. Tell me this wouldn't make you nervous, drilling a hole in your main spar. Okay, I'll buy it. Okay, those are eighth inch holes. I need to open them up for the screws, but um, I just wanted to get it in place and Clico down and be comfortable with it. Okay, there she be. Um, eighth inch holes for now right here where the sheet metal screws are going to go into the ribs. I got the holes drilled for the number eight, 832 screws to go on the front and back. It's clicoed into place. Um, so far, I haven't uh, scared myself too bad. Um, we'll take that off and we'll start on nut plates. Okay, so I set it in place. Make sure it looks straight. Take my transfer punch. Bop it. And I need number 40 drill bit.
countersink with a built-in stop. That should be good. Here's my nut plate. Both sizes of rivets, too short and too long. Easy enough to trim. on the rivet, not the nut plate. Feels good, I'll check it in a minute. Make sure the nut plate's up tight. Good. Oops, that's a drill. doesn't help that I haven't driven a rivet in anger since the 1970s. Okay, that should be good. Good on the bright side. Uh, all those rivets have to do is hold the nut plate from falling out when I put the screws in. It's a screw that does the work, so it's not not quite as critical as a structural repair somewhere.
Okay, so here's the other piece of the puzzle. Um, I gotta get the filler neck, you know, through that cover, and I gotta be able to put hose clamps on it when it's in place. The builder's manual suggests cutting a slot in the cover so you can slide it in. Uh, then I'd have to put something here to fill the front of that slot. I'm thinking, Tell me if I'm crazy. Maybe I am. We'll see how it works. Um, I'm just going to locate this, cut a hole in the cover. I can locate it from the um, holes that I've drilled to mount it. And then I can basically set it in place, put this down through it, reach underneath, tighten up the hose clamps. I can put um, you know, some rib nut, uh, nut plates underneath to screw this to the plate as well. And I, you know, as long as I can get underneath it and tighten it up, and then I can screw the panel down. So that's my plan. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm just going to be measuring from the holes in the holes, take a straight edge and line up things, and a hole saw, punch a hole there, and we'll see what happens. Okay, here comes the big moment. I'm going to throw a couple of Clecos in it first just to hold it. I'll put screws in a little bit. So let's get it into place. See if I. Oh, the hole could have been a little bit further that way. Now the question becomes, can I get under there and get that filler neck in, or does the filler neck even fit the hole this off just a little bit? I mean, you know, we're not talking. I'll bring the camera and show you. Okay, so you can, you can see it's, the hole needed to go that way a little bit, not, you know, not huge amounts. It's annoying. It's real annoying. Anyhow, let's see what happens. Okay, plan B. Uh, I got the fuel adapter and the hose clamps mounted first. And then I can slide this onto that. And all I have to do is push it down. That's good. Oh, one more thing I want to do. Well, it would be complete if I didn't forget something. Okay, that can go on there. But there's clearance, but not a lot. I just want to make sure that doesn't short out. Okay, now I can screw this bad boy down. Okay, there it is installed. Um, with any luck, uh, I still got some more tidying up to do. With any luck, it might even go flying tomorrow. Who knows? Um, so, thanks for uh, watching and catch you on the flip side. Well, just when you thought it was over, um, when I took the tank out, I. Uh, Looked for a leak, I found a leak, and once I found the leak, I stopped looking, and as it turns out, there were two cracks, and you can kind of see it uh, going across the middle of the screen, that that fine line in the in the joint at the top of the tank. That's the second crack, uh, so it's back out. The good news, of course, is that I have an aluminum cover over the tank, and I can get it in and out without a lot of fabric repair or without drilling rivets, so that's where we're at. Uh, Hope, uh, hope you found this entertaining. Bye.